so thanks for inviting me to speak here, and also thanks to the organizers for uh, putting together this excellent semester at IHP. So I'm going to talk about uh, topics that are somewhat related to the previous talk um, in a particular setting that's uh, that, uh, of, uh, called XOR games. Um, and let me just get into it by describing the setting. So first of all, many of you may have heard of the idea of non-local games, but I'll just review here just to uh, fix notation, and also for those of you who haven't heard of them before. Um, so a non-local game is a game played between some number of players. Here we've labeled them Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and uh, a referee. So the players are trying to collaborate and, and win against the referee. So what happens is that the, uh, um, the referee will sample a K tuple of questions. So here in the picture, K is three, so the referee will sample three questions from some set and then send one question to each player. Then the players have to somehow come up with answers to the questions. They're not allowed to communicate with each other, but they can agree on a strategy in advance. Um, then they send their answers to the verifier, or the referee, sorry. Um, the referee evaluates some predicate, which I've denoted by V here, uh, depending on the answers and, and the questions, and, and then uh, the predicate will output either win or lose. And then what are the players trying to do? They're trying to uh, win with the highest possible probability uh, over the choice of questions. So there are two scenarios that are of interest to us. One of them is the classical case. So, so just think of these as um, you know, classical beings. They, they can agree on some strategy beforehand. They can share random bits. Um, but uh, they can't uh, uh, communicate. And then the other scenario is where the players are quantum. They still can't communicate, but they're allowed to share an entangled state of, of pretty much any dimension. We don't put any constraints on the entangled state. Um, and now they're allowed to make measurements during the game on their part of the entangled state only. OK, so that's the general setup of non-local games. What's an XOR game? Well, it's a non-local game with a particular kind of, of predicate. So here, um, let me introduce some notation. So uh, a K player XOR game, we call the, the sets of, of, of tuples of questions in the K player XOR game clauses. Uh, and this is terminology inherited from the classical world, um, where people thought of these as constraint satisfaction problems rather than games. But OK, so a clause consists of some k questions, each question can go from 1 to n, so it's this n to the k here, and then also a plus minus 1 valued uh, thing, which I've labeled by s in the figure. And then what happens is that the referee will send each player one of the k questions. So Alice receives x, Bob receives y, Charlie receives z. And um, each player has to answer with an answer that's in plus or minus 1. And then what's the condition for winning or losing? Well, you win if the product of the answers was equal to this bit s that the, the referee uh, sampled at the beginning. So why are they called XOR games? Well, if you think of 1 and minus 1 as true and false, then this product function is taking the XOR of the answers and checking that it's equal to, to some fixed value. And just some more notation, we, we denote for game G, we denote the maximum probability of winning over classical strategies to be omega of G. And when you allow shared entanglement, we, we denote that by omega star of G. So omega star is always at least as big as omega. OK, and just one more technical thing. Um, so in this talk, I'll actually mostly be restricting to a class of these games that I call symmetric XOR games. So um, a symmetric XOR game is basically if I have a clause um, that's like x, y, z, s, then I should also have all permutations of that clause. So y, x, z, s, z, x, y, s, and so on. So the idea is that, um, and they had the same s. So, so this is motivated sort of by the, the classical picture where I want the players to just have a fixed assignment, uh, a fixed answer for each question. And they should all agree on what their answer is. So uh, it doesn't matter you know, to which player I address which question. They should give me the, the same answers. So that's the motivation for this restriction. But 
Um, this is sort of a technical point. You could ignore it if you want. Uh, and in this talk, unless I specify otherwise, all the games we consider will be symmetric. Uh, and, and just to reassure you, these games can still be interesting. So for instance, the GHZ game, which you may have heard of, is a game that you can win probably one in, uh, with shared entanglement, but not with classical strategies, is an example of a symmetric XOR game. OK, so what's the problem of interest regarding these games? Well, given a game and given some approximation factors, that we call them S and C uh, in computer science language, it's soundness and completeness, decide whether the game, whether there exists a strategy with probability of winning greater than or equal to C, or all strategies win probably at most S. So you can think of this as the decision uh, sort of formulation of the problem of approximating this, this quantity omega up to some error, right? So C minus S is like the error to which I want to approximate omega. So uh, how hard is this problem? Well, classically, it's, it's been well studied because of connections to, to things like constraint satisfaction problems. And sort of for any game, whether it's an XOR game or any other kind of game, this is always contained in NP. So there's always a, Sort of, you can just brute force search over strategies, or if I give you a strategy, you can check that it wins with a certain probability. So um, th there's this, this upper bound of, on how hard uh, this problem is. However, in the quantum case, we sort of don't have any general algorithms. And in, indeed, there's some special cases this problem, as I'll, I'll show later, are, are known to be undecidable. And so, um, yeah, so, so, so in the quantum case, we know a lot less. OK, and then uh, one special case that's uh, very interesting and that we'll sort of focus on here is the case where c is equal to 1. So that's the case where I'm trying to decide whether there exists a strategy that wins with, with certainty or, or not. And I call those strategies perfect strategies. OK, so um, that's the problem that we're interested in. So what are possible algorithms to solve it. Uh, well, for classical players, as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, this is uh, sort of equivalent to a class of problems called constraint satisfaction problems that have been very thoroughly studied in the classical setting. Um, and the number of algorithms for them, which I'll sort of characterize in, in three buckets. So the first bucket is brute force search, uh, which you can always do classically. But it's usually inefficient, right? Because the number of, of possible strategies you have to search over is, is large, uh, like exponentially big. The, the next family of algorithms is convex relaxations. So um, you can write down some, some linear program or semi-definite program that's supposed to approximate the, the classical game value. Um, and a lot of these are captured by a formalism called sum of squares, which I guess we heard a little bit about in the previous talk. Um, OK, and then the third bucket of algorithms is ad hoc algorithms. So for particular games or particular predicates, there may be uh, special tricks that you can use. OK, so that's the, the, the lay of the land for classical. Uh, what about um, the quantum case when we're trying to optimize over entangled strategies? So first of all, there's no brute force search algorithm anymore because uh, we have no idea how much entanglement might be necessary for uh, the players to achieve a certain winning probability. So we can't just search over all states and measurements that they could apply. There are convex relaxations, which we heard about in the previous talk, and they're based on sort of generalizations of this SOS idea. So this is often called the NPA hierarchy and their, their various refinements on, on this idea. But we don't really have any general convergence bounds. So you can construct these semi-definite programs that are supposed to approximate the game value, but we don't really know how good an approximation they are or how big a semi-definite program you need to take to, to get a good approximation. And then there are some, as in the classical case, there are some ad hoc uh, algorithms that work for particular uh, classes of games. But so far, they've basically all turned out to be special cases of this NPA hierarchy, like, like for instance, looking at the, the lowest level of, of the hierarchy.
So those are the algorithms that we have uh, at our disposal. Um, so what about hardness results? Uh, do we have any like lower bounds on how difficult these problems are? Um, so classically, uh, now I'm, I'm going back to the setting of XOR games. So classically for XOR games with three or more players, we actually know that uh, finding, uh, solving this decision problem for C being anything slightly less than one and S being anything slightly greater than a half. A half is special here because that's the probability of winning with random guessing. So you can always do at least as good as a half. So this is saying that sort of any non-trivial approximation to the classical value is NP hard uh, for at least three players. Um, and this is a famous result due to Hostad. For two players, um, it sort of depends on the values of, of, of the approximation factors you choose. So for some choices of C and S, you can actually solve it in polynomial time. But for others, it's still NP complete. Um, this is by reduction to the max cut problem. Um, however, there's this interesting fact for XOR games that, that there's this sort of ad hoc algorithm that lets us solve the special case where C is equal to 1. So if I want to decide just whether there exists a perfect strategy for a uh, perfect classical strategy for XOR games, there is an algorithm based on Gaussian elimination over F2. Um, and this algorithm runs in polynomial time. Uh, so that's an example of an ad hoc algorithm that works well. And another interesting point here is that the convex relaxations that I talked about based on, on the sum of squares hierarchy do not do well in, in this regime. So you can actually show that uh, they, they need exponential time to solve this problem. OK, so what about quantum? So uh, in the quantum case, we again have this, uh, an interesting ad hoc algorithm. So when there are two players, uh, then there's this miraculous result of Cyrilson that, in fact, exactly characterizes the strategies um, that, that uh, all, all the optimal strategies. So in particular, for any C and S you pick, solving that decision problem is in polynomial time, because you can use this beautiful characterization of Cyrilson. For more than two players, uh, we have an NP hardness result similar to this one by Hastad. So basically, the same parameters are NP hard. Um, note that it doesn't say NP complete, because we don't actually know that this problem is in NP. It could be much harder than, than NP. Um, but OK, what about this uh, C equals 1 for three or more players case that I talked about in the classical setting? What happens there uh, in the quantum world? So uh, that brings us to uh, our first result, which is an algorithm for this case. So to put that into context, let me just show you a table here of what we know about uh, non-local games. So uh, as I mentioned classically, we sort of um, we have a good understanding of these things. They're generally either in polynomial time or NP complete. Uh, quantumly, we have a few special cases where it's in polynomial time, which are these two-player XOR games here at Cyrilson. There's also this result on, on unique games. Um, but generally, they can be quite hard. And actually, we know, thanks to Slofstra now, that there are some cases where this problem is undecidable. So uh, in that context, what we show is uh, for XOR games, any number of players, deciding whether there exists a perfect strategy is, uh, can be done in polynomial time. So just to be more precise, um, our first result is given a description of, of, of a symmetric XOR game, um, there is an algorithm that runs in time polynomial on the size of the description. So the description is just a list of all the clauses that appear in your game. Um, and that decides whether the entangled value is 1 or less than 1. And we can also get this very loose upper bound uh, in the case where, uh, where it's less than 1. So, uh, if you want to think about this in terms of the classical picture, this is sort of an analog to that Gaussian elimination algorithm I mentioned. So this is a problem where 
uh, if you took c to be anything less than 1, it would be hard. Uh, but for the special case of finding perfect strategies, there's a magical technique that lets you do it. Um, another point to make is just, is just like in the classical case, uh, we actually beat the uh, convex relaxations based on the sum of squares hierarchy. So classically, remember I said that there was Gaussian elimination, but sum of squares could not solve this problem efficiently. Similarly here, we can show that there are games where you need to go to exponentially uh, high levels in, these, uh, in the NPA hierarchy to certify that there's no perfect strategy, but we have an algorithm that can certify this in polynomial time. So, so it's sort of a separation. Um, OK, so that's what I have to say about the worst case complexity of this problem. Um, let's talk about uh, random instances now. So um, classically, again, this is sort of a very well understood thing, and, 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 and quantumly, not so much. So what do I mean by random instance? Well, I generate, uh, I can generate a random instance by first fixing a number of variables, or the, the number of questions, which is that n parameter I, I wrote on the first slide, and then fixing a number of clauses, which I'll call m, and then just sampling clauses from the set of all possible clauses until I have m of them. So that's my model for generating these, uh, th these instances. And sort of in the regime I, I'm working in, it doesn't really matter whether it's sampling with or, or, or without replacement. Because I always take m to be uh, sort of order n. So classically, what's been shown is that uh, there's a, a threshold behavior for these random instances. So if the ratio of the number of clauses to the number of variables, this m over n parameter, is less than 1, then you can show that there exists a perfect classical strategy with high probability. Um, and this is sort of just, you can show it by linear algebra. Um, and if this parameter m over n is greater than 1, so there's more than n clauses, then the classical value actually goes down to uh, a half plus epsilon, so as, as low as it can be um, with high probability. And the proof of this is, again, not too difficult. It involves taking a union bound over all possible strategies. And so you um, can basically show that any fixed strategy has a very low probability of satisfying a large number of clauses, and then you can do this union bound, I guess. Uh, so I'm fixing the number of players. I think this, 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 I think, is true for any number of players. There are other thresholds for like when things can be efficiently so when I can efficiently certify that the value is less than one, and those depend on the number so you of players, can but oh, for for the for the first thing here, yeah. uh, yes, it's just that um, so you can think of uh, a classical XOR game with m clauses as a system of m linear equations over n variables in F two, and so then just if you have m less than n, then uh, it's like a system that's uh, you know you're going to have a solution. So that at least reasons why, why that part doesn't depend on the number of players, and then the, the other part, I think, doesn't depend either. OK, so that was the, the classical. Uh, setting. Um, OK, now what about the quantum case? So here, uh, we basically didn't know. Uh, anything at all beyond what we knew classically. So first, I can always say that uh, in this regime where m is less than n, the quantum value is 1 with high probability. Why? Just because the quantum value is always greater than or equal to the classical value, and I knew that the classical value was 1. OK, but what about when m is greater than n? Uh, so this brings us to our second result. So we show a threshold behavior. Um, for these random games. So we show that for each k, so k, remember, is the number of players, there exists some constant ck, depending only on k, such that uh, if I take a random symmetric game with m over n greater than ck, then the quantum value is less than 1. 
So, so there's a threshold above which there's no perfect strategy. OK, and what is CK? If K is odd, we can actually show that CK is equal to 1. So uh, this is, um, uh, so, so this means that for wh when the number of players is odd, we actually have exactly the same behavior uh, in the quantum case as in the classical case. Um, when K is even, we're, we're not able to show this. Um, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of, when, when I discuss the techniques later, I'll sort of explain why this occurs. But uh, this is an interesting problem to see if we can close the gap for, for even numbers of players. OK, and then we have another uh, result related to this, is, which is uh, for random games, we can show that there, uh, there's a regime where uh, a random game has no perfect strategy, but it's hard to certify this using the NPA hierarchy. So you actually need to go to a number of levels in the, in the hierarchy that's uh, super linear in, in N, um, or, 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 or in the size of the game. So this is interesting. If you're familiar with the classical uh, results here, is that the classical sum of squares hierarchy always gives you the exact answer at, at level n. So this is something that's impossible in, in the classical setting. OK, so those are our main results. And now for the rest of the time, I'm going to explain where we get these results from. Um, and it turns out both theorems actually rest on uh, we proved them sort of using the same techniques. And uh, the key technique is uh, something that I guess you could call going to the dual picture. Um, so the idea is that for these quantum games, talking about strategies is difficult, right? Like a strategy could be some terrible infinite dimensional entangled state. We have no idea what it is. We can't uh, analyze them. So instead of looking at strategies, let's look at a sort of dual object, which we call a refutation. And what's a refutation? It's a certificate that there is no perfect strategy. So um, why is this interesting? Well, you could use this to, to solve both of the problems we talked about. So for this worst case problem of just given a game, decide whether there's a perfect strategy or not, you could try to search over all of these certificates. And if you find one, then you know that uh, omega star is less than 1. And then for random games, you could try to show that, um, that, that certificates exist or don't exist with high probability. So that's the motivation for looking at these certificates. OK, so what do they look like? In order to explain that, um, let's first take a detour to the classical case. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you what a perfect strategy to a classical game looks like. Uh, question? Yeah. Quick question. When you write omega should be smaller than 1, yeah. do you mean bounded away from 1? Like there's this constant such that omega is smaller than 1 minus epsilon, uh, minus that constant? Uh, no. So we don't. Because you have like limit n and n going to infinity. Could it like, does it, could, does it double the both one possible? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we don't have any bound that says that doesn't happen. So, well. There's two questions. So for a fixed game of some fixed size, then we can, uh, you know, this algorithm can decide whether it's 1 or less than 1. And there we can give some bound of how far it is from 1. But that's, that scales like 1 minus 1 over exponential in n. Um, yeah, so this is actually a very interesting open problem of like, can you get what are called strong refutations? So basically what you said, like that omega star is a constant below 1. OK, so um, perfect strategies for the classical case. So there are a few observations that, that we can make that simplify our, our life. So I, I said that in the classical case, um, you know, you're allowed to have shared randomness. But uh, sort of by a simple convexity argument, you can see that shared randomness never helps you. So you should always just use a deterministic strategy. So that means that whenever a player receives a question, they should always uh, answer with, with, with the same answer. You know, they should have a fixed assignment of answers for questions. And also by the symmetry, you can, uh, you can assume that this optimal classical strategy is, is, is symmetric, um, meaning that all the players behave in the same way. So what's a strategy then? It's just an assignment of answers to questions. So for every question x, it's an assignment ax, which has to be a value which is either plus or minus 1. 
OK, so that's a, a complete description of a strategy. And then when is that strategy a perfect strategy? It's when it satisfies all of these conditions. Ah, um, so uh, the, uh, the conditions are for every clause x, y, z, s. So remember, x, y, z were the questions. s was the sign bit. Um, I, I require that ax times ay times az is equal to s. OK, so that's what a perfect strategy is. How would I certify that no perfect strategy exists? Well, let's just think about the a axes as variables that, that obey these algebraic rules. So they have to square to 1, right? because they're supposed to have values plus or minus 1. And they all commute with each other, because they're supposed to just be numbers. So using these rules, we're going to try to show that if there exists a perfect strategy, then we can prove some impossible fact. So what we're going to do is take products of these clauses that are all supposed to be true. Right? So each clause is an equation. We can take products of the equations. And we want to deduce an impossible thing, in particular that 1 is equal to minus 1. So we call a product of clauses such that the left-hand side multiplies to 1 under the rules uh, on the first bullet point and the right-hand side multiplies to minus 1, we call that a refutation. So let me illustrate this by example. So here is a game that uh, you may be familiar with. It occurs a lot in the quantum information literature. It's called the magic square game. So here I'm going to think of this as a three-player XOR game. And um, the, the, the clauses in this game uh, are as follows. So I have nine variables, which I've written out on a, on a square here. And uh, I think this is the pointer. OK. Uh, does this work? OK, so anyway, uh, I can use the mouse. So we have these nine variables, which I've arranged on a square here. And the clauses in the game enforce the constraints that the product of variables along each row should be equal to 1. So I have these three clauses here, a1, a2, a3 equals 1, a4, a5, a6 equals 1, a7, a8, a9 is equal to 1. And then I also enforce the constraint that the product of the columns has to be minus 1. So a1, a4, a7 is minus 1, and so on for the other columns. So this is my game. It has six clauses and nine variables. And I want to claim to you that there's no perfect classical strategy for this game. Uh, how would I do that? Well, um, in this case, it's actually quite simple. There's a refutation which consists of just If I multiply all the clauses, I have three ones and three minus ones. So I'll get minus one. Right? Now, what about the left-hand side? If you see here, each variable, so a1, occurs twice. So a1 occurs here, and it occurs there. a2 occurs here and there. And I said that all these variables commute with each other, and they square to identity. So you can see that the left-hand side will just multiply to 1. Right, so then this is 1 equals minus 1. It's a proof that there's no perfect strategy. OK, so um, are there any questions at, at this point? OK. So that's what a, a refutation looks like in the classical case. Now we're going to generalize all these ideas to the quantum setting. So what does a perfect quantum strategy look like? Um, a perfect quantum strategy is a state psi in some Hilbert space. That's the shared entangled state that the, the players have, and measurement operators that each player applies to their share of the state. So here I've labeled them a, b, and c for Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And they're also indexed by uh, the questions, x. And since their answers in the game are plus or minus 1, I can represent their measurements by uh, self-adjoint unitary operators, so, so observables that have uh, eigenvalues plus and minus 1. 
OK, and what are the rules that these things have to obey? Well, they have to square to identity. That's just a statement that their uh, eigenvalues are plus or minus 1. Now, there's this commutation constraint which encodes the fact that the players cannot communicate. They can only act on their share of the state. So all of Alice's operators have to commute with Bob's operators, and Alice's with Charlie's, and Bob's with Charlie's. So that's this constraint. And then finally, they need to win the game with certainty. That means that, um, so, so that can be enforced by this condition, that if I take the state psi and I act on it by a, x, b, y, c, z for some clause x, y, z, I should get s times psi. So remember, s was plus or minus 1. And then this means you know, if I sandwich this expression with a psi on the right, that means that the measurement outcomes when Alice, Bob, and Charlie measure their, their states with these operators will always uh, multiply out to be equal to s. OK, so uh, as you can see, this is quite similar to what we had classically, um, except now we have this difference that uh, not all the variables uh, commute with each other. So in particular, ax and ay for x not equal to y don't have to commute. So things that act on the same player are not necessarily commuting. OK, so now let's generalize this idea of refutation. We'll do basically the same thing. So a refutation is a sequence of clauses such that if I take the product of everything on, on the left-hand side, I will get the identity operator. And if I take the product of all the signs on the right-hand side, I should get minus 1. And uh, when I'm evaluating this product on the left-hand side, I'm only allowed to use these rules that I specified. So things square to 1 and things on different players commute. So let me just make a few remarks. So every quantum refutation is automatically a classical refutation, right? Because if, if this uh, equation, you know, if these things multiply to identity under these rules, they'll also multiply under the classical rules where everything commutes. But vice versa is not necessarily true. And also, quantum refutations can be much longer because, uh, for instance, in a classical refutation, there's uh, sort of no need to use a clause more than once. Because if I use it, like, say, an even number of times, then I can just move all those copies of the clause next to each other by commutation, and they'll all cancel. Um, so I basically have to use the clause either 0 or 1 times. But for a quantum refutation, since things don't commute, I might have to use each clause an, an unbounded number of times. So I don't really have any bound on, on how big the refutation has to be. Um, and indeed, as an example for that magic square game, I showed you a, a nice refutation of length 6 in the classical case, but the, the shortest refutation I could find in the quantum case is length 66. OK, so we've uh, sort of reduced on. Uh, sorry. Uh, so there, there is for the two-player version of the Magic Square game, but not for this three-player variant. Uh, OK, yeah, sorry. so for, for those of you who've seen the, the Magic Square game in the two-player setting, um, it's, uh, the, the, the game, that game is not quite an XOR game because you ask Alice to say, give you the values of all the uh, variables in a row, and Bob to give you the value of all the variables in a column. And then, uh, so, so the answers are not just zero, and one, or not just plus minus one, they're at least triples. Uh, so that's a bit different from our form formulation here. OK, so now I'm going to state sort of the, the, the key fact here that uh, makes this refutation useful. So I define, this is one way of showing that there's no perfect strategy. So if I can exhibit a refutation for you, but maybe there are other ways. How do I know that this is the only way you could do it? Well, it turns out we can show that um, basically this is uh, the only way to show that uh, uh, there's no perfect strategy in the sense that if there's a perfect strategy, then there's no refutations. And if there is no perfect strategy, then there does exist a refutation. So that's this lemma here. And I won't go through the proof. I'll just say that it uh, exploits the NPA hierarchy that you heard about last time. So it, uh, basically, we show that if 
there's no refutation, then we can explicitly construct uh, a solution to the NPA hierarchy at all levels. And then by the convergence of the hierarchy, that implies that, the, the, that omega star is equal to 1. So it's a sort of non-constructive proof. Um, and also, I just want to remark that refutations are sort of intimately related to the NPA hierarchy in that if there's a refutation of length L, then the Lth level of the NPA hierarchy will find it. So you can, you can view the NPA hierarchy as sort of searching over refutations in addition to, to, to looking at more constraints. OK, but if, you, if you're not familiar with the NPA hierarchy, you could ignore that. The main point here is that uh, we've reduced the problem of, of checking whether there exists a perfect strategy to checking whether there exists a refutation. So, so those problems are equivalent. But uh, it doesn't necessarily seem that I've made the task that much easier because, as I said, the refutations could be immensely long. I mean, how do, I don't have any bound on how long they are, so how can I search over them? So that brings us to the next point, which is that a refutation, if a refutation exists, this actually implies certain constraints on the game it came from. Um, so what are these constraints? Um, so recall what a refutation was. It's this uh, product of clauses where, where things multiply to identity on the left-hand side. So how can I multiply to identity, right? Whenever I use an operator, say AX, like say um, in the first clause of my refutation, AX appears. It has to be canceled by another occurrence of AX somewhere else. Because under the rules that I've stated here, that's the only way to, to get rid of AX, is, is to multiply it with another copy of itself. So first of all, that tells you that, that a refutation has to have even length, and every variable has to occur an even number of times. OK, uh, simple enough. Um, now, here's another thing that you can notice is that not only does AX have to cancel with another occurrence of itself, but if I look at the location of that occurrence in the refutation, so these locations are, are labeled by 1 up through L, that location has to have opposite parity. Right? If I'm at location 1, I could maybe cancel with, with something that's adjacent to me, so that's at location 2, or I could cancel at something that's uh, two positions away, so location uh, four, or, or so on. But it always has to be uh, opposite parity. OK, so that's another constraint. So if I put these things together, what this means is that each variable ax has to appear an equal number of times in even numbered positions as in odd numbered positions, because every appearance in an even numbered position has to be canceled by one appearance in an odd numbered position. OK, so these are all constraints that are necessarily satisfied if I have a refutation. And now we can package up these constraints in a nice form as a system of linear Diophantine equations. So let me explain how this occurs. So let's think about uh, a refutation as uh, in terms of a collection of clauses. right? So, so this refutation that I've written down here maybe it contains clause number one three times, clause number two, four times, and so on. And I'll put all those counts into a vector, which I'll call v. So v has dimension m, because it, it, uh, each component of v counts the number of times a clause occurs. Now, I actually don't quite want to do that. I want to count the number of times that clause occurs in even positions minus the number of times it occurs in odd positions. So that's what v is going to be. And now, if I look at the, the constraint that I wrote down up there, each variable ax uh, has to appear um, an equal number of times in even and odd positions. So how do I get the count of the number of times ax appears in even positions minus the number of times it appears in odd positions? I just uh, have to sum up over uh, the v's that contain the components of v that correspond to clauses containing ax. So I can put that into a matrix M. And then I just have an equation m times v is equal to 0. So this equation is, is really just saying that uh, what I set up here, that each variable has to appear an equal number of times in even and odd positions. OK, now I have a second constraint, which uh, I wrote here this s 
inner product of v is equal to 1 mod 2. That's just, if you recall, um, the other part of, of, of being a refutation is that the right hand side had to multiply to minus 1. So this is just encoding that fact. So for every clause, um, s is, is, is now a vector containing the value of, of, of these signs for all the clauses. And the condition that this multiplies out to minus 1 is just the same as, as this inner product being 1 mod 2. OK, so if you didn't quite follow how that occurs, uh, really this is just notation almost. Uh, all I'm doing is taking the conditions that I, I wrote in the first bullet point and writing them in this uh, nice form. The, the, the important contentful thing is that we can show that actually these constraints, you know, it's obvious that these constraints are necessary, but they're also sufficient. So whenever you satisfy these constraints, um, there exists a refutation. And I can't tell you the proof of this because it's, it's a little bit involved, but it, it, it's basically constructive. So whenever I, I find a solution to these equations, I can give you a, an algorithm to, to compute this refutation. That's how I found that refutation of length 66 that I mentioned a few slides ago. And now, once you have this lemma, sort of the, the theorems that I claimed earlier are, are not so hard to prove. And I won't show you the details, but just a one sentence explanation of why this lemma is useful. So for uh, theorem one, which was saying that in the worst case, we can decide whether there exists a perfect strategy or not. Well, how do you decide? You just solve the system of equations that I wrote on the previous slide. And this is a system of linear di Diophantine equations, so you can do it efficiently. There are standard algorithms. And then uh, the lemma implies that if there's a solution, then omega star is less than 1. Otherwise, omega star is equal to 1. How about theorem 2? Here we have this funny business of odd versus even numbers of players. But we have this simple proof that works for odd numbers of players is that we can, we can take the, um, the system of equations that uh, we had before and then sort of argue that for a random uh, game, uh, this system is likely to have a solution, um, basically just by using some linear algebra arguments. Um, and uh, this involves some, some tricks with symmetrization that, uh, and this is where the dependence on k being odd comes in, uh, but I can't explain that, so if you, if you have any questions, you can, you can ask me later. Um, but okay, so just to summarize, what I've uh, shown you is that, uh, so, we started out trying to look for these uh, you know, strange objects, these perfect strategies to quantum games. And we saw that, in fact, looking for refutations uh, makes it much easier to, to solve these problems. So uh, a strategy is hard to characterize, but these refutations are, are sort of easy to characterize. They're just um, nice sort of algebraic objects. Um, but there are a number of questions that are still left open. So, First of all, there's this uh, technicality about symmetric games that I mentioned earlier. So can we prove a lot of our results hold only for symmetric games, and can we extend them to the non-symmetric case? Uh, and that's interesting because you might worry that uh, the symmetric condition makes it harder for the players to use their shared entanglement. Because sort of by monogamy of entanglement, they don't know who they're supposed to be highly entangled with. Um, so you might think that symmetric games are are more classical than non-symmetric games. Um, so that's a motivation for that question. Then for even k, of course, can we make this threshold tight? Um, and now there's some further questions. So uh, now that we have this understanding of when perfect strategies exist, can we use this to construct families of games that have perfect quantum strategies but very low classical value? So often in the physics literature, this is called like unbounded violations of Bell inequalities or unbounded bias ratios. And so we think we have some constructions. This is uh, uh, work with uh, uh, Gurtej Kanwar, who's also at MIT. Um, but uh, uh, it'd be interesting to explore this further. And uh, another question is, uh, so this method of using refutations is nice, but it's not constructive, right? So when I certify that, that the game value is 1, I can't actually exhibit a strategy for you. That, that achieves this value. So it would be interesting to see when we can actually realize this with, with say, finite dimensional entanglement. And then finally, there's this question that Matthias mentioned, which is, uh, 
when there's no perfect strategy, well, how, how good is the best strategy? Can we find strong upper bounds on omega star? And finally, can we extend any of this to other families of games? So uh, that concludes my talk, and uh, thanks for listening.